vocabulary um, because it, the, the fun part is, you, you know, if you were the, one of those kids that you struggled, it's making fun of, you know, what you had to learn growing up because you, you, you learn all these vocabulary words and then you get out to the real world and they say, OK, you can't use those words anyway. They're five dollar words. People are going to be mad at you. Keep it simple. So it's like, why did I learn all these SAT words in the first place? Uh, so it sort right. of, you know, pokes fun at, you know, all this education they cram into us that we don't get to use. Um, and it, I think it also makes it fun because you have the real definition should you want it. Right. <laughs> you may not. You know, so it, it again, it's on a variety of levels. Like, wow, that's a real word, or here's a silly word that, of course, I know, but I never thought of the word this way. That's absolutely true. So, so what are a couple of your favorites? Oh, oh my! One of my a- absolute favorites is um, uh, the word grammatology, which you know, right. don't ask me its real definition because it's the made of definition to me is a lot more fun. It sounds like it should be the study of grandmothers. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, I happen to remember that one was the study of grammar. Yes. But the study of grandmas, so that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, one of the, the fun ones I love to do at my show, and this is a word everyone knows, is elixir. You know, uh, E-X, uh, e- wow, I'm blanking on the spelling, but e- elixir, of course, uh, which sounds like how British men give oral sex. There you go. Elixir. Exactly, which is exactly what happens. The audience, I see them either out loud or in their heads saying it, you know, in a British accent. And it's, it's hilarious because, you know, it's, some people, it takes them a second yeah. and then they, they bust out laughing. And it, it's one of those things you will never hear that word the same way right. again. And you'll just start giggling to yourself, which is the whole point. Because on, on the other side, I, I think there are some folks that were either good, you know, with their English classes and then some folks who were good at math. And maybe, the, you know, the math folks were intimidated you know, by words. And, you know, if they had to write a paper, it was the worst thing in the world, whereas I was horrified by matrices. And this is something that I think pokes fun, but, you know, in a, in a lighthearted way. And it's like, you don't have to struggle. <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's another one. It's one of my favorite T-shirts, and I don't own one, but I keep meaning to buy one. And it's a totally reading, you have to read it, you have to see it joke. And I'm going to explain it on the show, and my listeners will probably most of them know it. But it says there are 10, 1 followed by 0 types of people in the world, uh, those who understand binary and those who don't. Yeah. And so it's <laughs> 1, 0, so it's 2 <laughs> instead of 1. It's a binary joke, but it, it's, not, it's not something you can tell. It's something they have to read to get. Right. You know, it reminds me of, um, I went to Dragon Con last year for the first time, and yeah. it was it, like an overwhelming but wonderful experience. And my favorite T-shirt there was, um, what do we want? Time travel. When do we want it? Irrelevant. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. Yesterday. N- irrelevant. Irrelevant. Timey-wimey. Well, here's one of my favorites. Uh, Brouhaha. Ah. Uh, a beer garden comedy club. <laughs> nice. See, so so, uh, listeners, of course, you can get this book at all great bookstores or Amazon or is it on your website? Can they buy it there? Oh, sure, sure. They can, you can go to my website and buy it, which is veryfunnylady.com. It, there's also dickjokes.com, which I, I always like. When you're typing, please be real careful with that one because I, I can't be responsible for where that's going to take you. Um, but it is, you can absolutely get it on Amazon. You can get the digital version, the Kindle version on Amazon. Well, that's what I got. It was really handy. Yes. Uh, just uh, you can go from Facebook right to dick jokes. The, uh, the, another one that was a, a good one for me, f- being a fan of the 80s, was Eurythmic, What Sweet Dreams Are Made Of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the millennials might not get that one so much. Well, that's okay. It, for me, that's perfectly fine because they don't have money. Ah, there yeah, we go. Someone once said, they said, Phil, when I look at your logo, it reminds me of something from the 70s. And I go, perfect. And they go, well, don't you want to appeal to a young audience? And I go, well, that's nice, but most 25-year-olds don't have a whole lot of money to invest. Yeah. Aha, uh-huh. know thy audience. I was just about to say that. We are so in sync. Oh, that's kind of scary. But, yeah, I went through and uh, – oh, here's an Italian word. I don't know if you knew it was Italian. I might not have. What is it? Paparazzi. Paparazzi, of course. Well, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, your answer is ex-Pope's Ratzinger's hip-hop name. <laughs> See? <laughs> And I thought, not only for me, not only is it a good Italian word, but it is talking about the Pope. So it really fits my show. There we go. 
I aim to please. You know, it's funny. I had um, a professional, of course, professional proofreader uh, proof the book. And it was funny when I got it back, you know, that started out very professional, you know, very, you know, you know, just making, you know, corrections and edits. And then as it went on, I could see this person was really warming to the book. Like they were like notes in the margins, like, ha, this is funny. Oh, I love this one. Or this one's my favorite. Oh, I see where you're going here. So it was almost like I made a friend <laughs> by the time, you know, the proofreader got to the end of the book, which was just delightful for me. Oh, I've got one last one at the end of the alphabet here. It was, I think this was the one that my wife actually laughed the loudest at. Uh, xenophobia, fear of <laughs> Xena, warrior princess. Nice, nice. Oh, once again, oh, you have to be of a particular generation, I think, to uh, appreciate that. But I'm glad she laughed it loud at that one. Well, it, and you did have some that were very uh, time sensitive, temporal. That, yeah. You know, that it, it, it shows the year that you wrote it because it's about a person that was famous, maybe really famous then. But now a couple of years later, you're like, who? Oh, OK. OK. Um, I'm, anybody in particular? Any word in particular? Uh, that? You know, it didn't. No, not now. I mean, there's okay, there's hundreds fine. of them. So, it, you know, but uh, there was also ones that uh, uh, it's something that I wouldn't use. You use the uh, the word boo. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, and and urban colloquialism. <laughs> yeah, and, and did I say that correctly? <laughs> I, you tell me. I it's not a word I use, but uh, I was in a um, uh, airport getting ready to go on a flight, and I stopped at Queen Anne Pretzels, and I got a, a pretzel and a drink. And uh, the the young lady behind the counter, she goes, "What you drinking, Boo?" Aww. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm looking around. I'm like, what what is what's going on? <laughs> I thought I had an out of body experience there or something. And she was trying to scare you. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that I, I found really comical about, uh, you know, language and stuff like that, uh, I, I went through a drive through at a McDonald's in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and uh, a young, uh, lovely black gentleman uh, took my order, and he was speaking as if he was from North Dakota, eh? Aw. And I was like, I did not expect that. Did not see that coming. Aren't those great? Yeah, it, it, it shows, you know, it, it's an effect of where you live, that how you talk, because you talk like those that are around you. Exactly. Exactly. And it, it's interesting, you know, the preconceived notions that you have with the way people speak. Like I caught myself, I was, I was very embarrassed when I'd gone um, uh, to the conference in Tennessee and met Southern atheists. Like it never occurred to me. And I know that sounds absolutely ridiculous and probably insulting, but I'm outing myself and being very honest. You don't expect to hear someone talking about, at least I didn't being a New Yorker, and that's probably my bias, you know, about, you know, secular life with a Southern accent. You just have this idea that it's all the Bible Belt. <laughs> well, and it, it's, it was very refreshing that it wasn't. It was challenging to the ear, but refreshing for the mind. And I wonder sense. if my listeners have this same feeling that I do. Um, in about a month, in the first weekend of March, I am going to be in Nashville, Tennessee, for what I will call a regional conference. A half a dozen local groups are putting this together, and they're putting it together on a shoestring budget, and within weeks. I mean, they just had the idea a few weeks ago. So oh, in, wow. in less than two months, they're going to put together a conference that's probably going to have 300 to 400 people. Wow. I go to Chicago, or you go somewhere like Boston. And you get a, you go to an atheist meetup, and there's like five people there, <laughs> and they go whatever, you know. Yeah. It, uh, I have meetups in Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, home of the University of Illinois, big college town, and people show up and they go, yeah, I just I guess I wanted to know that you guys were here. Uh, see you later. Or uh, students that come to the University of Illinois, be, why why are you guys even meet? What what's really the problem with religion? Because they're from Chicago, they don't see it like you do in Nashville. Yeah, it's a it's a different experience. I, I know when we did the African Americans for Humanism campaign, um, you know, where it, it wasn't, you know, it was sort of it was geared specifically toward the African American community and about the whole idea of it is just saying you're not alone. It was just that simple statement uh, in ten cities. And, you know, I'm in New York. It was, you know, the, the billboards were beautiful. I took pictures. I posed next to them. You know, it was pretty fun. You know, people sent me pictures as they came up. Um, not a big whoop. In New York City. Yeah. Uh, the Texas one, Alex was getting death threats. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it was that different. And of, you, mean, of you mean Alex Jules, right? Alex Jules. Yeah. The amazing and brilliant uh, Alex Jules. And it was, it was amazing to me that 
our experiences were so different. I mean, not amazing, but you understand, you know, that, that it could be that drastic and we were living on the same planet in the same country um, that it would have that such a, such a visceral and hateful reaction from people who are supposed to be um, God fearing and, you know, loving. Well, we look around at each other here in uh, Champaign, Illinois, and we're thinking, really, there's somebody that might vote for Donald Trump? Oh, trust me, I don't get it either. Yeah, but you go to some of the small towns. I mean, you don't have to drive real far from from Champaign, Illinois, to hear banjos in the woods. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, uh, you know, about thirty miles south of Chicago is Dixie. Wow, um, it's like the yeah. old the old joke. Uh, Pennsylvania is uh, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia with Alabama in the middle. <laughs> That's funny. And you get people there going, I like what he's got to say. He's going to take America back, and we're going to be just like it was in back in 1955 after we we got rid of them Nazis and, and women uh, couldn't vote, and, and everybody was pretty happy just to have a seat on the bus. And you right, just go, right. Every, everybody oh, knew their place. Oh, so yeah. Speak. That's, yeah. Place. That's, that's the word for it. Yeah, um, yeah it is. I, I'm, con- I'm conflicted, though. Because my, I remember a few years ago, I started asking the question, where did the hate go? You know, when, I mean, when you have, you know, the civil rights movement, when you have all these, you know, was that rights, before Obama got elected? You asked this? Uh, yes, it was actually. OK, because you've seen it now, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, I see it now. <laughs> but, but it's like you, you realize it doesn't changing laws and, 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 and all that doesn't make it go away. You know, and so what does it morph into? How does it show itself? And if it just feels clamped down, how does it bubble back up? And now we do. I, of course, see that. And I think some people are amazed by it. Um, my, I remember my dad, uh, when I used to drive to work with him in the mornings, would listen to this, I mean, absolutely rabid, um, racist, uh, very, very conservative radio show. And... Uh, my dad's a black guy from Brooklyn. I'm like, Dad, why are you doing this? And he said, it's important that you know That's and right. remember that people don't think the same way that you do. Well, you, I had, uh... you have to hear it. You have to see it. So because you can lull yourself into thinking, oh, everything's fine. And then someone like Donald Trump pops up and you're shocked. You know, so maybe what he's showing us while vile is important, you know, in this process of america that we have that we're not all healed it's not all better i had a a relative and i won't get too specific just in case anyone i know in the family listens to my show from time to time but uncle jim are you talking yeah yeah it was it was one of those kind of things uh and uh for my listeners uh prepare yourselves i I know i use language but uh, uh he said something along the lines of uh uh that nigger will be in the white house over my dead body oh and the karma that came to roost for him was two days after obama got elected he had a massive heart attack and died oh my god that's awful it is awful but he was kind of in some ways an awful guy yeah and and once again and this is why my life is difficult i'm conflicted because part of me wants to go that's karma you know he brought it on himself uh on the other hand illness you know I, i i'm stunned at those people that think Illness is a punishment for behavior, okay. as if good people don't get cancer. Right, and, and, and it's for me, it's hundred percent tongue in cheek. I'd, yes. I'd rather he would be alive and not a bigot. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> but I didn't get control over either one of those options. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and you know what's funny? I talk to people about this, and then people are like, "Oh, there's never been a president that's gotten as much hate as Obama." And I'm like, "Were you asleep during the Bush years?" You know, it, it, we ju- you just switch sides of, of who, well, that's, you know, that's right. it, hated it, I, I, I mean, know I'm probably guilty of that because when I hated on Bush, I felt like he deserved it. Oh, yeah. And so I'm, I'm absolutely positive that the people that hate Obama think he deserves it. You know, he can't right. do anything right. And it, co- it really comes down to if it's your guy in office, no matter who it is and what office, they can do no wrong. And, you're, you know, you'll, you'll you know be on their side if it's not your guy there's absolutely nothing you can do <laughs> that they can do that's going to sway you or make you happy did you see the obama you know? video that, that he himself is in where he has a glass of milk and a big cookie no what is this oh it, what have i missed <laughs> it, maybe I'll, I'll i'll lace that into uh the interview here later but i probably won't because i don't really edit so listeners my apologies 
You go to a, uh, YouTube and you look it up, and Obama is sitting.